Hey, David. Uh, good morning. How's it going? It's going quite well. Good. We actually just upgraded to uh, uh, Google Mail corporate-wise. Oh. Uh, all the CNCF meetings got dropped off. It oh, no. Kind of, <laughs> it was kind of funny, actually. It was like, hey, uh, so, but it's, you know, it happens when we, uh, it's not uncommon when mail uh, services merge or change and things like mm -hmm. that for something to get dropped off. And uh, most of the external meetings, uh, anyways, that's TMI, but uh, so I had to go back and read the notes to make sure I can get in correctly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it is still amusing to me that how after all these years, you know, we claim to have standards around mail protocols and stuff, and yet the different mail systems don't seem to work quite right together. It's amazing to me. Yeah, there's always uh, seems to be a one-off implementation per per uh, site as well, which, yeah. is, which is the part that we ran into. That's an, an old config of Exchange uh, customized to the corporate how things were working. So it's that's part of it as well. Yeah. Today is the SDK meeting afterwards? Um, this week is, no, this week is interop. Interop, okay. Or discovery interop, yeah. All right. Um, hey, Matthew. Hello. Do, do, do. We actually have a very short agenda today. I was struggling to find other topics to add to the list, so maybe a quick call. Not that I'm sure anybody would mind. Hey, Tommy. Yo. Yo. Hey, Scott. Howdy. And Eric. Hello. Hello. Hey, Ginger. Hey, Doug. How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm fine. Made it through the debate and everything last night. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching that and I kept thinking, okay, what are people going to do with the fly? <laughs> <laughs> I swear that the best, the only thing that I, I could attribute to making it through the whole 90 minutes was watching the live tweeting going on by people because it was <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Hey, Slinky. Hey. Hello. And there's someone else. Oh, Manuel, are you there? Yeah, hi. Hello. Thomas. Hi there. Hello. Hi. Hey, Remy. How's it going? Good. It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's always good. <laughs> All 
I was saying earlier, we don't actually have a whole lot of topics. So if, if you guys can think of things, please let me know. But otherwise, we really don't have a whole lot to discuss. There are just a couple of issues I added to the end of the list that I thought might be interesting if we have time. <laughs> hey, Lance. Hello. I managed to download it in time and get here. Uh, excellent. <laughs> Hey, Mark, how's it going? Hi, Doug. Da -da -da. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, four. Is it five sevens or? F yes, five sevens. Let's see if he gets that. Christoph, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. Let's see if I can spell your name right. Holy moly. Do, do, do. Brian. Hello, Doug. Hello. Give another minute or so, then we'll get started. Mr. Mitchell, howdy. Hello. Thank you, Manuel. I'll try to add that to the list. Hey, Nick. Hi, Doug. Sorry, I didn't see the password up there. That's the okay. Documents. Keeps you guessing. <laughs> hey, Jim, you made it. Yeah, well, you bullied me into it. Right? <laughs> You're not supposed to say that. Holy cow, that was supposed to be secret. But oh. yes, yeah, like, hey, it worked. You do that to other people as well? <laughs> you have no idea how many people I ping behind the background. Oh. No, I'm just joking. No. It, it just I happened to be on the Slack channel, and I, I don't know why, but I... Um, I noticed that your icon was looking like it was typing. Um, so I decided to pick on you. So anyway, all right, why don't we go ahead and get started? It's three after, um, let's see, how many people, 18. All right, uh, any other, or any, uh, anything from the community you wanna bring up? All right, just a reminder, um, we do not have the SDK call this week. This week we have the Discovery Interop call. I haven't seen any thing going on with the doc itself, so that might be a quick call. So I'll be thinking about if there is something you guys want to talk about there. Um, I don't see Timur on the call, and I don't think offline he mentioned me anything too exciting going on there. Um, so we can probably skip over that. All right, before we jump into PRs, any other topics people think I should have added to the list? All right, let's get underway then. So I did not notice any comments on the bulk import thingy. What do people want to do with this? Um, Clemens said he could not make the call today. Uh, so I did ping him about this when he mentioned that to me. Um, he didn't mention he had any objections, but I also got the sense he may not have actually fully read it either in, in full disclosure. Um, if this wasn't my PR, I'd say we merge it because <laughs> no one's had any complaints for two weeks now, but I'd also am aware of the fact that being the moderator, I don't want to be biased. What do people want to do? Are there any questions all on it? This is for the management API? Mainly yes, yes. Well, I'm going to be honest and say I have not read this one but it seems fine. <laughs> <laughs> Through osmosis, it feels good. Um, okay. I, I, given the spec is so new, I'm inclined to say let it in and we work through PRs to fix it. Um, I did implement this, so that, that was a lot of the driving force behind some of the changes I made as I was, as, as I was doing the PR. Um, I mean, to be honest, if, 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 even if we go so far as to say, eh, screw it, we don't want to do imports at all or anything like that, we, we want to rip it all out, I'm okay with that eventually. I just, I just feel like I want to make some forward progress because I would like to test this as part of the interop event, if, if possible. And I believe the interop event is scheduled for, what, November 2nd or something like that, which is less than a month away? I didn't read it as well, but uh, I'm curious now. But uh, I agree with your statement. I think we can merge and fix uh, after. 
Okay, so I guess I'll just formally ask the question. Is there any objection then to accepting this for the, for the draft? Is it required? Is it required? I believe so, because I've, if I remember correctly, I think part of this scenario that we're gonna talk about in the interop is uh, setting up like a circular list or at least some sort of linked list of, of DEs, right? And so when you start doing that, you need some way to possibly mass import stuff. But that's in the push versus pull model. Of yeah, th this is definitely the, this is definitely the pull model. Yes. That seems fine. The pull, the push model, ha well, no, this is the, this is the push model. Well, okay, again, yes, you're right. You're right. I was thinking of it backwards. You're right. This is the client pushing a whole bunch of things into the server. So this is this is more for uh, 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 initial loading more scenarios. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's symmetry with the the pull model as well, so it seems fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> In that case, moving forward. Um, Slinky, do you want to talk about your WebSocket one? Because I know you made some changes, so maybe too soon to merge, or maybe you could update people on. Well, uh, I didn't any changes uh, oh. in the past four or five days. Oh, I'm I sorry. did I just one change. Okay. I did just one change now to to fix some uh, some conflicts with master. But that's it. Oh, that's it. Okay, sorry then. I didn't realize. Yeah, and I okay. for me it's fine, and you can go ahead and merge it. I think uh, Clements looked at it. Uh, well, it's, um, I don't remember the name of the other guy that looked at it. Twing? Uh, that's uh, Thomas, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Thomas? Yeah. So, well. Okay. Um, you may want to take a look at the Travis build. But yeah, no, the Travis, no, the Travis build is, uh, is failing because uh, I do a link uh, to, uh, in, in the readme, a link to the, to the spec, ah. and that fails because the spec yep. is still not there. Okay, right. that makes perfect sense, okay. <clears throat> in that case, um, I'll take your word for it that Clemens is okay. He hasn't mentioned anything to me offline. Does anybody have any questions about this or comments? I am excited to use this. Do you feel comfortable, Scott, us merging it without people having played with it? Actually, let me, let me back up. I, that, that's probably an incorrect assumption. So, so Slinky, you wrote this up. Have you actually coded it up and verified from a coding perspective that everything sounds right? Of course. Of course. <laughs> I, 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 I just took the, the, the there is, a, there is an, a sample in the SDK JavaScript. If you're going to read me, I wrote it. There is a sample in the SDK JavaScript that already basically implements this, except for the subprotocols part. And I implemented the subprotocols part, and it's like five lines of code. So, cool. Feel free to submit a PR to the JavaScript SDK with uh, those changes <laughs> for the exam. Sure, sure. And not sure, not sure where where they fit, honestly, because that's in that sample you you don't have like like a client or what or something. Well, yeah, we can think about it, but yeah. All right, cool. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Okay, oh, Jim, your hands up, yep. Uh, just a very quick one, and I, I must admit, I've, I've, not, um, <clears throat> I've not read this all the way through. It, there is a handshake, yeah, so you know that when you've sent one of these uh, events down the wire that it's actually been accepted? Or, yeah, or is it yeah. like a fire and forget model? No, 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 no. There, there, uh, there is an handshake only to agree on the uh, event format to use. So I, That's when all the I, when handshake. I, okay. So when I publish something, it, it's sort of in the wind at that point. There's no, I, I get no indication that it ever got anywhere. No, no, that's, okay. that's, uh, that's, that's more the semantics of what you do with that. I mean, I think this, uh, if I understand correctly, this is out of the scope of cloud events protocol bindings. So we don't define semantic, we define only how to smash stuff inside the envelopes, right? 
Yeah, I, well, I, I think you're sort of right. I mean, we, we, you know, from an ATP perspective, there's a webhook spec which sort of tells you, you know, how to handle statuses. Um, and I assume that when uh, the AMQP binding was written, there's sort of this underlying assumption that, you know, AMQP is going to tell you, you know, when stuff got delivered or not. Um, but I think, does that need to be made clear that is, this is like a, just a fire and forget protocol or am I overthinking it? I, I, to be honest, to be honest, I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, you, an hypothetic application uh, could decide to define, I would say, a protocol on top of it. So, for example, to say, uh, so one end sends the messages and the other end replies back uh, with an act. In, in the shape of a code event. But that's something that you define when you create the application. And, and the reason I asked that is because, you know, I was mentally preparing myself to look at a gRPC transport. Um, and that, that same sort of thought was, was resonating with me as to whether, you know, that transport should have some sort of acknowledgement uh, capability in it. Okay. Uh, that would be my only comment, and I'm not sure there. Um, I'm not sure it's in scope for a transport. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions, comments? All right. Any objection to merging then, or proving? Cool. Thank you for that, Slinky. All right. That's it for the open PRs. Um, a couple of issues I thought might be interesting, mainly because I was trying to think of which ones might actually impact the uh, coding effort. This one, I think I opened this one because of, of a comment I think Scott may have made on a previous phone call, which is, should the epoch value actually be global and not just specific to one particular service? so that we can do something like query a discovery endpoint and say, give me all the services that have been updated since a particular epoch value. And obviously that's only going to work if you have sort of uh, an increasing epoch value that goes across all services and isn't just local to one particular service. I actually like this idea a lot. Um, I don't think it's a huge burden um, because, it, because it does require uh, even though it does require uh, some sort of locking or, or consistency mechanism across all the uh, services, I don't think it's that big of a challenge for people to have a <clears throat> an ever increasing number across them all. Um, but what do people think? Good, good idea, bad idea? Need more time to think about it? I don't think you can do this. Really? Why? Because if you have a chain of, of producers and you do that aggregation mode, each link in that chain would have to increment that that value because each cons uh, each producer would have to be in charge of whatever that value is so if you end up with that ring situation you would get an ever increasing uh epoch value as it synchronizes because the value would always be different to that producer Yeah. I wonder what the real world scenario for that ring would be. Uh, I think uh, accidental complex systems. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just if I, if I look at DNS and, and all these other maybe somehow related technologies, I'm not uh, familiar with any concept there that they have something like a ring. Well, actually, so wait a minute. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry, Scott. Maybe that isn't a problem. Because I think the way you described it is if you have a ring, you would have to sort of synchronize the epochs across the whole ring or the, the, high, the, the next available or the highest epoch value across all the ring. And I'm not sure that's true. Because with the PR that we just merged of mine, of the mass import thing, I specifically say when you import something, the epoch value gets reset based upon what that DE wants to set it to you don't retain the epoch value. Uh, 
So I don't actually think you need consistency across, of epochs across all of the, uh, across the entire ring. I think once it, you, when you, you can still deal with things on a service by service basis in the sense that you get, you, you want to pull something in to your, you, you want to pull something in and it has a different epoch value. You're going to, you're going to import it. Oh, wait a minute. What am I trying to say here? Something, I had something in my head and then it just left. I apologize. I, 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 I'm just, I think even with ahead. your previous PR in, in the push model, the, the, cons the producer you're pushing the, the new services to is going to get confused around the epoch because it might not be uh, maybe even, maybe it's not global to it. I, I think you're going to end up with a wrong value on the, uh, the producer you're pushing to. But if the, if, the, if the guy you're pushing to resets the epoch value, or basically ignores the incoming one because you're doing an import. He's going to assign a, 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 the next highest value, right? Yeah, but the whole point of having the epoch is to be able to compare what you have to what you're getting. Right. I'm talking, I, was, I was specifically talking about import, not update. But in the poll model, you do need that value and you need to trust where it came from. So if you're doing like a, a service that does a combination push and pull, now you're confused again. Okay, so let's walk through that. Right, you're doing a pull model, and it's doing an update. Um, if the epoch value of the thing you're pulling is less, I would assume you'd ignore it, wouldn't you? That assumes that your producer and the, and the downstream producer are, uh, they have epochs that are uh, equatable, like time. Maybe, but if you turn it around and you're doing an update via push, the discovery endpoint should reject the request if the epoch is smaller, right? Because that means they're trying to update based upon an old thing and they need to refresh their copy. Well, okay, let's, let's say two nodes in that ring, one increments epoch by one and one in increments epoch by a hundred. Right. They're going to get out of sync, and the uh, the source of truth won't be able to push to the downstream because its epoch will be significantly smaller than the uh, thing it's trying to push to. Yeah, I see what yeah, I see where you're going with it. Okay, never mind. Let me think more about it. It may be something we have to kill. Yeah, I think epoch ha it has to be uh, each is probably unique for every producer in, and it's only comparable for a particular producer, unless it's something very complicated like a, like a Kubernetes service where you're using resource version. I'm kind of wondering whether the entire idea of synchronizing between discovery endpoints might require its whole a whole different set of semantics. I'm wondering whether, you know, uploading a set of services from an end user perspective is different than uploading a whole bunch of services because you're trying to sync between two discovery endpoints. Yeah. Well, so to give more context for the group, what I'm trying to do, what I would like to do with this, the two specs of discovery and subscription is to be able to do uh, upstream and downstream upstream uh, subscription propagation so that I have a, I have a complex uh, system that's delivering events with subscriptions onto it. As new subscriptions get added, uh, it propagates the, the fact that it, there's now a requester of a certain filter downstream to the upstream producers. Mm -hmm. So you get, you get, uh, you block events if they're not being listened to as far up the chain as possible. But I also want to bring down what's available from, from that chain to the downstream uh, consumer perspective. So if there's a long chain, the, what's available to make subscriptions on comes from the fact that the discovery endpoint has aggregated all of the services all the way down the chain. 
right? Makes sense, I think. Do people have a different use case? Well, I would assume that usually there is somewhere a source of truth where someone deploys a new version of a service or provides this discovery content and from there it's propagated into one direction. Yeah, that's right. But you need to understand uh, which service that thing came from. So as it comes down the chain, larger epochs of the same service are, should be trusted. So. I, I kind of feel like you can't change the epoch of things you've seen, even if it try to make it relative to yourself. And so where the loops come in is once you do have that long chain, it becomes very easy to make little eddies in the, the loop where, you know, in the middle of your chain, something branches off. Uh, and those go a couple hops and then goes back into an upper part of the chain. And now you, you have a loop. So one thing about your use case is, um, does it apply? Um, I mean, what I added here as a remark, does that apply to your uh, use case as well? So that on the way, the um, some data in that discovery uh, has to be changed like uh, the subscription URL or something like this or is it will it all be um, propagated unchanged I think that might be the up to the each chain so you, you might want to say actually no I you uh, get subscriptions from me and I'll delegate up the chain or you, you might say uh, no you go reach out directly to that consumer or sorry that producer I think it might depend. Okay. Okay. I think more thinking needs to be done on this. I, I'm starting to I'm starting to wonder how complicated the discovery and point synchronization problem is going to be and whether that is something we need to address immediately or first focus on just a simple administrative API. I would keep it simple to start and not worry about the semantics because I think it's going to get complicated and probably unique per, per environment. Yeah. Well, if we, if we did that simple approach, then does that mean that this, this issue becomes more possible? But I don't know what global means in this, this case. I just meant global within the DE as opposed to service specific, which I think is what it is today. Oh, I think the only way to trust is, is if it's, you know who the service came from is. Right, like it's a relative value you're comparing with different versions of that instance of the service entry, mm -hmm. not, um, it's nothing more than that. It had like, Epoch has no actual meaning. Right, right, and that's, that's the way it's defined today, right? They don't, it, it, you can only compare it against a different version of the same service. Um, but what this doesn't allow you to then do is to say, give me all services that have been updated since a particular epoch value. And I'm, yeah, doing, right. and, and I'm, and I'm wondering how useful is that scenario? I thought it was useful, but if it's too difficult to do, then we can drop it. I just thought it was, I thought that was kind of an interesting thing to do for somebody who wants to, sort of monitor an endpoint and they're not doing it through, um, monitor a discovery endpoint, but they're not doing it through notifications. I think we should punt on that, to be honest. Let's get it, let's kind of get it up and running. And then once somebody comes back with the problem of, hey, I have this discovery endpoint that has this thousand services and it's too difficult to understand what's updated, then we solve this problem. Okay. That's my opinion. Okay, anybody else have an opinion on that? Okay, I'm okay with holding off and waiting, so we can do that. <clears throat> um, all right, in that case, one of the other ones I thought was interesting was from you, Scott. You were suggesting that it might be nice to have labels. Is that the right one? 
yeah, labels. Um, so for example, here. And as I was looking through the issues today to see ones that might be of interest, it dawned on me that this is having horrible flashbacks to buckets for extensions in the CE spec. And I'm wondering well, for, whether, yeah, go ahead. That was, a, that was a terrible name for them, but. <laughs> yes, but so technically, what is the difference between this label versus an extension of the top level called prod colon what it's or what sits? What's the difference to you? Uh, the, I think the difference is that labels actually has semantic meaning, meaning that it's it's a identifier with uh, right. It's metadata instead of something that is an actual property. Uh, Jim, your hands up. Yeah, I, I guess I would echo Scott. I, it it seems that. If you want to look for labels, you want to look somewhere, not just at random stuff that's appearing in the higher level object. Just a way of grouping, logically grouping things so you know where to find stuff. Right. I, I kind of get that. But I guess, <clears throat> it, so if, if labels were only the, the way of sort of adding tags to things, like a GitHub, a GitHub label, strictly a tag, Right, and that's the only thing GitHub does with it. It's just tags, you can search on them, period. However, and if you look at what, how, how they're used inside something like Kubernetes, um, in particular, annotations and labels are kind of done the same way, where people use them to sometimes change the semantics of what goes on behind the scenes, right? So they're not simply a tagging mechanism or a searching thing, right? Okay. And, and that's when I start wondering, well, okay, you know, at what point does, who sits, how do, you, how do you distinguish whether that's just a tagging thing versus a semantic thing? And to say, oh, well, you shouldn't use a label if it's a semantic thing, it's a property then, it gets very, very fuzzy to me between the, uh, between the line, which is why we killed off the entire concept of buckets to begin with in, in the CE spec. But isn't the, um, it's, I, I get the difference between, see, I don't think the, of these as tags. Anything that's not a key and a value is almost like a, well, it's a pair, yeah? Tags for me are just a list of random things. Uh, but at the end of the day, aren't these only of value to, the, to anybody that has to understand them? They don't, you know, they don't need to have value for anybody else. Right, to and I and I would I would claim the same thing is true for top level extension properties. Right, Th this is this is one of the things that keeps running through my mind is is anything anything you could anything anybody could possibly say about what is special about a label versus what's special about an extension. I bet someone could make the exact same argument and switch it and say, no, I'm going to use label for exactly what you want to use top property for, or the other way around. Because I, I think I, I think and I'll let I'll yeah. you know uh, yield after this one. But I think the point is that if you I don't use the word bucket, if you group stuff like that, at least it's safe. Yeah. Um, you're not gonna get future collisions at the at the outer layer. Yeah, if I if I add an extension of a particular with a particular label. Uh, and then you come along and change the spec later on. Now, now there's a collision, yeah, because you haven't you haven't got a, a namespace for those um, for those tags or labels. We're repeating history here. Yes, Wait, we are. Yeah. Right, I'll yield. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It, 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 it's bound to happen. So, Thomas, your hands up next. Mm -hmm. It's actually uh, funny because we just introduced that because we we uh, uh, we, we plan to use cloud events and we just added labels to it as as optional things to mark uh, certain attributes and and give the flexibility to the teams implementing that and there I see the the huge uh, advantage you give so much more flexibility. Uh, there's always a trade-off to this, of course, because uh, then you're out a little bit in the wild, but uh, it gives uh, a lot of flexibility. That's what I see. And, and we see it more like uh, your label issues. I think in GitHub, that's also available, right? Where you say, oh, this is a bug, or this is a to-do, or this is 
this and that. I see it more that way, that more in the way of a tagging thing and, and you use it to group or something like that. Okay, and Scott, your hands up. Just wanted to point out using labels and annotations in Kubernetes to be stuff that should be in the spec as an anti-pattern. Shame on you, Doug. Me? I'm, the, I'm thinking about K-Native. <laughs> yeah, we, we use it to turn on and off features of, uh, of how to interpret things, but really it's, it's not a great pattern because you don't get, there's a bunch of other things you don't get if you change the label. You don't know how to compare the spec and you don't know which version of the labels is reconciled currently and which one's failing. It causes all sorts of problems. Um, for this, I think um, maybe a distinction we make is that as you're importing things, you don't, there's no requirement to persist the labels from the downstreams. So those labels are yours to be able to understand that record. And they're maybe not linked to the epoch. Oh, now you're adding a whole bunch of complexity to it. <laughs> right, I want these to be metadata to be able to, for if I'm a producer, I have this list of services, I've applied some labels, maybe I've allowed some labels to propagate down and I've appended some more, uh, but it's for my consumers to kind of give context to the, the service entry. So are you, are you actually suggesting that uh, in an import command, we actually don't retain the labels? I think it's the judgment of the producer to, to choose if it wants to save or reject the labels. Right, because like I could assume you could you would do some sort of uh, block list of maybe there's sanctioned services that get propagated down and uh, maybe use those labels to be able to re restrict the propagation of that service or the import of that service. Hmm. I have to think about that one. Okay. Okay, well, we don't have a PR either way on this one. Um, I just wanted to get a sense of where people's thoughts are because I gotta be honest with you, I still see them as being no different than extensions. Um, and I know that it's, it's, it's hard to think of it that way for some people because of the semantics that go along with labels, but it's just a name value pair to me and where it sits doesn't matter, but Okay, so if somebody wants to make a PR either way, you know, feel free to. I just want to get the discussion going so we can try to resolve the issue one way or the other. Yeah, this I raised this issue just to ask the group, is it worthwhile to try to introduce this before the effort of writing the PR? Well, there at least are some people who are interested in labels is what I heard. Um, take that for whatever it's worth, Scott. <laughs> okay. Uh, next, um, I don't want to talk about the extension ones. Let's talk about the one that uh, Manuel brought up here in chat. Uh, who is this? So Alex Collins. So Manuel, since you yeah. wanted to talk about this one, do you want to introduce it to the group? Uh, yeah, the title is a little bit misleading, but what I got from Alex Collins, he reached out to us and asked about um, standardizing this is that um, when you do webhooks from GitHub and GitLab, you get different headers set that try to authenticate with whoever receives the webhook. And um, he sees this across different kinds of uh, event sources that they are uh, getting uh, data from. I think what he wants to have is a little bit of a, a unified uh, way of how these sources are authenticating. But the interesting thing that came up here is, uh, so Alex Collins is from Argo and Argo uses an event gateway, it talks cloud events. And when you use the standard webhook, you get an HTTPS uh, channel to your uh, receiver. So that is a confidential channel. And you can use the JWT, the um, authorization token, the bearer kind with a Java web token in it. And um, that one would 
uh, authenticate with the receiver, but what, um, since they are introducing this gateway or they have this intermediary, what it does not guarantee is that from the producer to the eventual consumer of the payload, um, nobody guarantees that the uh, the content is not messed with. So, uh, this is something for which you would want a message or payload signature. And um, I think this, this problem might have been solved with the use of the authorization uh, JWT URL in GitHub and GitLab. But what we don't have in cloud events is a message signature or any word on how to use signatures uh, if usable from transport layers or whatever. So I wanted to bring this up and ask, uh, how do people feel about message signatures? Or am I maybe overlooking something? Um, is there maybe in the Java web token or the in the OAuth um, specification a way to also introduce a signature that would, uh, a signature of the payload that is of the, 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 the data transported in the HTTP webhook? Anybody want to chime in? I I know it's something that has been nagging at me for a while, um, uh, and I think there's a need. I, I I can understand how we can add signatures, you know, when we're using I don't know the base sixty four encoding stuff. Um, I get a little bit concerned as how we would do signatures in JSON sort of structured mode. You know, because that that's going to be a bit interesting. But I think it's I think there needs to be a way to do um, this sort of signing and verification. Yeah, in GitHub you actually get both with their own header. So what they do is they sign the HTTP message payload, and then um, whoever receives it can check with that header uh, received whether the signature is is correct. Uh, in GitLab, you don't get they uh, get that they only send a token. But so really about end to end so con producer to consumer message signatures. Um, I'm I'm not sure how to feel about this either. But I I thought it might be a, a, an interesting topic. Um, there is Java. Uh, oh, sorry, not Java, sorry, <laughs> JSON web signatures. And it's used as part of the JSON web tokens um, to sign the JSON, uh, the web token. Uh, there is this uh, JSON web signature standard. And it, I think this is a signature that works on JSON. It could be used for structured mode. Um, the only thing is that it, when transport is, uh, what is it? Oh, I, the HTTP structured transport where cloud events uh, parameters are put in the HTTP headers, uh, you'd have to recreate the JSON structure first before you can uh, verify the signature. That might be a bit of an overhead. And then I don't know um, if, if that is really, uh, if that should sign the entire cloud event or if selected headers should be excluded from it. Um, so really, Anybody have a use case? It seems like a pretty interesting extension. We so in Kenya that we're doing, we're looking at similar ideas, but nothing formal yet. But basically, we want to know who is who is authorized to receive a certain event, and so the, some way for the producer to be able to say, "I've made this thing." send it down a bunch of middlewares and the middlewares can filter based on subscriber um, authorization. Do you happen to know if the JSON web, to a web signature is um, flexible enough to uh, select only parts of this JSON structure to verify with the signature? So in HTTP, in structured mode, you can also promote uh, member member fields into the headers, but it's important to make it work with um, every protocol, and make it be lossless. Yeah. So I just want to make sure I understand. He's just looking for us to standardize it or 
yeah, standardize a particular signature header, right? It seems like, I think with cloud events, checksumming might be uh, not a great pattern because it could change format and it's still technically the same message or it could change transports and it's still the same message. So we'd have to think about how how we do signing for, for the consumer, for the consumers to understand a producer produce this variant of the message, but we allow for extensions to get globbed on in middleware. So like, how do we deal with that? Yeah, and I, and I seem to recall in the past, we, we purposely kind of avoided security because it's a, it's a whole rat hole all by itself. And I'm wondering whether we want to dive into that at all. Jim, your hands up. Yeah, sorry, I, I completely had to drop off. Um, so I, I missed the last couple of minutes. But when we talk about signing, we talk about the event, uh, the, the event data, not the whole cloud event. Is that correct? Just the business data side of it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah I don't think it not... says, does it? That would solve my concern. Because if you wanted to use JWT, then you just would, yeah? You would send it as, as a JWT or, or some sort of signed construct in the data payload. If you wanted to make sure that, I don't know, the source is not replaced or um, other fields of the event, wouldn't you want to select those and make a signature for them as well? The, yeah, I, <laughs> yes, I, I think that's the trouble. Yeah, there are two levels of, there are two levels of signing. Um, one is the, th that sort of envelope, enveloping sort of construct, and one is the, the data itself. And, and probably they need to be done independently because I don't think, I don't think cloud events needs to make any statements about how you choose to sign or secure your content because that's really up to you, but it's more concerned about the, the enveloping aspects and the attributes. But middlewares are allowed to change the envelope. Right, so they, the middle bit the, is the contract then between the producer and consumer and the intermediary. Yeah? That, they're the ones that need to know that the enveloping wasn't being messed about with. And the, the data is always passed without um, interpretation or trans potentially, and if you wanna transform it between formats, then that would have to be a trusted party. And then your relationship from a signing perspective would be with that translator, not with the end producer. The trust relationship, yeah. I sense someone's digging a gigantic hole. Yeah, yeah, I've got a spade. <laughs> oh man. Is, I'm not saying that, okay, but I'm, I'm gonna ask a question. I'm not suggesting that if the answer is no, we shouldn't necessarily close the issue, but I am curious. Does anybody actually want to head down this path? I think we need statements about it. I think we need principles or something around, you know, um, where the responsibility lies, if nothing else, yeah? And if we want, if we want to ensure that those um, cloud event attributes have not been messed with, um, then we will have to address it, I think, and sort of formalize how those should be signed. Well, that, that's kind of what I'm asking, right? Do we even want to touch that? Because it, it is a whole big ball of wax. It, it, it is. And there are lots of different specs out there that already talk about how to handle security. And getting a green uh, interrupt. I'm just, I'm just having flashbacks to my web service days, right? I mean, we tried to create these web service specs, but everybody wanted to do security slightly differently. So we created a framework, but there was zero interrupt. But hey, we can claim interrupt because we all adhere to the WS security spec. But, you know, each exact mechanism within the WS security spec was implemented by just one company. So you had technically zero interrupt. And I think the fact that we got zero interrupt was is telling that maybe people necessarily 
want to interrupt, but can't. But, but I mean, do you get to the point where maybe your statement is simply, you know, the, the signing of the payload is, is out of scope, you know, that, that's somebody else's problem. And you have a trust relationship with um, the endpoint that you're delivering events to. Um, and it's that trust relationship that, that implies that data, those headers are not going to be uh, mutated along the way. And it sounds very hand wavy, but it, it, I think you need to make a statement one way or the other and say it's either definitely in scope or out of scope. And I don't know where that statement lives. I could have sworn there was something somewhere that said, maybe it's in the primer, and said, hey, we we're not going to test security. <laughs> That's out of scope. But I can check. I was involved in that original discussion, and, and it was something that we said would at least be punched to the future us. You were a little hard to hear there, Eric. I think you said we there's something someplace and we decided to punt it. Is that what you said? Uh, sorry. Yeah, I was, I was part of that earlier discussion. Uh, Clemens was the uh, large objector at that point. And uh, I've actually been, even though he's not here, expecting him to speak up because of it. But um, <laughs> it's silly in my head. But well, here you go. Uh, anyway, the, um, uh, we, we basically said that we were going to punt it at the least if, if we ever dealt with him. Um, I, I think there's another concern that if uh, something like you need the original producer of an event to sign off on that event and then an uh, intermediary wants to add, uh, add to that event, that you probably need to leave that original signature in place because it in some way is going to have to be something only that original producer can produce. And then uh, so the augmenter of the event is going to have to add some kind of an additional signature. Um, and specify what they added or something like that. I, I think there's some, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm off on a weird tangent, but um, I think there's some really weird stuff that can come out of this. Yeah. Okay. So is there anything that people want to suggest in terms of next course of action on this one? Oh, Klaus, your hands up. Yeah, so I remember that uh, also in the early days, I, I at one point asked uh, if um, the uh, context attributes may be uh, modified by intermediaries. And, and I think just for that discussion, we introduced the term intermediary originally. And, and so the result was that, yes, that's possible. And um, if you want to allow this, so why, why would you now create a signature mechanism to prevent this? Uh, if, I, if I may, I think the signature doesn't prevent the modification. It's just to secure uh, certain fields. So you could still have a lot added to the event, but you wouldn't want the source to be changed, for example. Yeah, so that's what we, I think, added in the in the primer or somewhere that um, if you change certain fields like source and ID, then this is technically a new event and not the same anymore. But um, right. yeah. Right. Sorry, it was a bad example. Yeah. In the primer, I think we talk about how the envelope properties should be regeneratable from the payload. Although that's it's a recommendation, not a requirement. Maybe I know. Hmm. Hold on, let me see if I can bring up the spec or the primer. So by the way, the spec has a section uh, about security. It's just mentioning that. Uh, um, context attributes shouldn't uh, contain uh, sensitive information because um, at that time we, I think we, we always thought that just the payload would be um, encrypted but it's not really about doesn't really touch the signature topic. Yeah I wrote that. <laughs> ah. I, but the payload I, recall, I think oh, sorry sorry go ahead. Isn't, isn't that why we introduced data ref? so that uh, we could delegate encryption to a, a second party just in case uh, some stream of events get replayed. You get this trouble of if you encode the key in the, in the cloud event, then you don't understand how to, like you can't do key rotation if you have a historical event stream. 
I think that was one of the use cases. Yeah, the other one, the primary one for that, I believe, was sort of large payloads. I believe. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was the main driving force for that one was large payloads. But you could certainly use it that way because that, that's another interesting scenario. Yeah. Trying to find that section you were just talking about, Scott. I don't, nothing's jumping out at me. Okay, but as long as it's in the data, um, that is an end-to-end -end or application problem. So the application should deal with it. That is the producer and the consumer. I think we agree on that. Or would should cloud events um, provide a field to store a signature? Is that really off the table? Signature of the payload. So I think if you were to add a, a new optional property called signature, you'd then have to define what it was for. So I don't think anything stops you stops us adding it, but you'd have to then be prescriptive about what that signature was. Well, this is a very good case for the our extension model. It's a formal extension that's not part of the spec, but if it gets adoption, then it gets promoted into the spec. Good call. So Scott, was this this text you're thinking of? My stuff I yeah, highlighted? I, yeah, that looks right. Because that's not quite the same thing as saying, hey, we recommend you be able to recreate all of the CE metadata. It just says it may be duplicated in some cases. Yeah, I might be quoting an old version. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're almost out of time, but back to the issue. Um, is there somebody who actually wants to try to take a next step on this? Or is it still unclear whether we want to do anything or not? Just trying to figure out, Manuel, since you're the one that mentioned this, uh, does somebody actually want to like create a PR, add more discussion to the issue? How do you guys want to move forward on this? Um, I'd wait for this one for Alex to get back if he wants. Uh, I, I can ping him and ask him if he uh, needs anything or if he wants to drive this forward. And uh, if anybody wants to pick up the signal, I personally don't have a use case for it, but if anybody has a use case, um, can bring it up again. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great if you can poke on him and see what his thoughts are. That'd be great. Okay. Um, with that, at the end of, uh, Klaus, do you want to talk about this one at all or defer it? We're almost out of time. Do it. Um, the null values? <laughs> which yeah, the null, yeah, the null value one. I just wasn't sure if you want to talk about it since you had some. I don't know. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to. We're almost out of time. It's up to you. Um, that was that old discussion where I um, found that link for Slack uh, somewhere down in the discussion, or was it that one? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if I click on it, whether it'll show up properly, so I won't click on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I just remember that while preparing, uh, I think the demo in for, for Barcelona and, and during that debugging session uh, <laughs> the night before that demo, um, we, we uh, encountered some problems uh, and, and it was originally due to some null values uh, in for attributes. And um, then we had that discussion how to handle it. Um, and that uh, an attribute not being present would be the same as no value and just as a distinction from the empty value, of course. Um, I'm not sure what else was discussed here in that issue. I mean, I didn't open it. It was also the SDK discussion, I think. Yeah. How this so, is handled in the SDKs, I suppose. Yeah, I'm, I was going to ask, how do people either in SDKs or just in general feel about this? Should null be semantically equivalent to absent? 
What are the SDKs doing this stuff? Ginger, or jam your hands up? I don't think so. I, know I would have to go back to the cloud event spec and see whether it even mentions this. Absent any particular encoding scheme, does it actually say that an, an attribute can be present but empty? Because I don't no. think it does at the moment. Yeah, but what's interesting is the spec specifically says for almost every single attribute that it defines, except for extensions, it says if it's present, it must be a non-empty string or something like that. Right. So, and, that, that, and, But what's funny is Clemens, you know, he's been here from the beginning. He's, he's still interpreted that as giving you the freedom to say, oh, it could still be null. Now we can come back and say Clemens well, is wrong. If, if, the word, <laughs> if it's the word null in a string. But no, 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 that, no. He, he means, he means, you know. I know he means nil. Yeah. No, sorry. No, yeah, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Which to me, you know, that's very Jason centric. Yeah. Not doesn't follow the spec. It doesn't follow the spirit of the spec to me. Okay. Uh, Slinky, your hands up. For me, there should be any difference. Um, uh, if you pick, for example, HTTP address, HTTP address cannot be empty. So that this doesn't apply to, to an event that comes from HTTP. Uh, so in, in general, in the SDKs, uh, like in Golang, we don't make any distinction. Uh, in, in Rust and in Java, we make the distinction, but only because the language allows us to do. But you will never get an empty attribute uh, in the Rust SDK, for example, when, when you receive the event from HTTP. So I just looked at this for Go, and it looks like I, we can support uh, the JSON nil value, but it's custom marshalling. I think there shouldn't be a nil value. But of course, empty values should be possible, although the standard attributes usually don't allow it. Well, if I, if I, receive, a null, if I receive a null value, now I'm thinking about uh, SDK Java, if I receive an empty null, uh, if I receive a null value in JSON, uh, it's just null uh, in the cloud event. If I receive an empty value in JSON, it gets back uh, I mean, uh, the attribute is, is an empty value, so it's an empty string, for example. Uh, while um, from HTTP, it's always, uh, I mean, uh, it's or null or something, it cannot be empty. If the attribute is not present at all, what does the consumer of no. the cloud event say? No. 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 Okay. Uh, no, it, it's null be just because uh, that's, that's the semantic of Java. Right. Like, like in Rust, it's, it's known because that's right. the semantic of the language. I think that's what Clemens stated as well, that uh, of course for um, strongly typed languages, internally you will have null values. So how, it, <clears throat> if I had a, a structured JSON cloud event with the word nil against an attribute value, what happens when I want to send that over a, um, you know, turn, turn it around and send it over a binary, as a binary payload. Am I meant now to put an HTTP header in and the string null next to that? No, no, and no, it's a good thing you mentioned it that. Be it, it should be an absent. Uh, it should, the, the header should be there if you have right. null. In but my point is, what, why is it, I, I still don't understand why it's even in that JSON structured document in the first place if it's well maybe maybe it shouldn't be there i mean maybe maybe in the json spec we should say that now it's not allowed as attributes well, well in I, json I, it's very important for patching because you want to know if you want to clear out a, a value some on some struct no it's not no i mean what, 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 why do you need it if you for example uh because I mean, be no, if, the, go ahead, go ahead. if the attribute name is not present in the patch, you don't know to clear that particular field. So if the attribute's present and uh, the value nil, then you, you know that that update is asking for that property to be deleted. Okay, so I'm gonna have to call time on here because I apologize. I didn't realize it was after the top of the hour already. Um, so let, let, 
let's try to continue the discussion in the issue itself, because I do think we need to kind of resolve this one way or the other. It's a little bit ambiguous. And okay, bye, Scott. Um, so thank you all for joining. I guess there's one, uh, so hold on a minute here. Before we let people go, I think I only missed one person. Um, Has Hasashi, are you there? No, they left, okay. Uh, please make sure I got your name for the attending list. Does anybody have any topic for the discovery interop call? Because I know Scott had to run, Slinky's running. Is there anybody who was doing the interop stuff who has a topic? If not, we'll cancel the call for the next hour. I do not, uh, <laughs> I need okay. to work more on it. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, I didn't have anything myself either, so we can, make, we can just cancel the call. Okay, in that case, we will cancel the call. Thank you everybody for joining today. And please do comment on some of the issues we talked about here. Try to get a discussion going, whether you wanna close the issue or someone wants to PR it, please try to get some discussion going. All right, and with that, thank you everybody for joining. We'll talk again next week. Thanks, Doc. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Cheers. Right.